my two-year-old nephew a couple of weeks ago while my sister and her brother-in-law went out of town on vacation. And we had this routine every night um, before bed after he would take his bath and brush his teeth. We'd lay in bed and we'd read a couple of books together. And one of his favorite books to read is Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See? I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the text. If you're not, it's a classic story about a bear that sees a fox, and then a fox sees a turtle, a turtle sees a frog, and so on. But they're all telling what it is that they see in response to the question, what do you see? We usually conclude our reading by pointing to various things in the room and saying what it is that we see. I see a, clan, a, lock, a clock, I see a lamp, I see a table, and so forth. This afternoon, I see a lot of things. I see local pastors who are working to shape and mold our communities. I see friends that I've had the privilege to do ministry with. I see sisters and brothers in the faith who are working tirelessly to improve the efforts of the church. Today, I have seen many of the life-giving ministries of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, and I have seen so much of what it is that we have to be hopeful for. I am grateful to see. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A friend of mine that works with me just recently lost several close family friends in the flooding that happened in Wimberley a couple of weeks ago. She took some time off to serve on a search crew in order to look for the victims. They found six of the eight individuals who did not survive, and they're still in search of two. I was so curious about what this experience was like for her, so I sat in her office this last week and I asked her, what did you see? Painfully, she recounted visions of uprooted trees, 40-foot debris, surge dogs wading through rubble, and families in grief that were told to look for swarms of flies or birds that might indicate a body. This is what she had seen. If you've paid any attention to the news or social media, then I'm sure you've seen headlines about these horrific floods. Or you've seen equally as horrific headlines about the oppression, hatred, and racism that is alive and well among us. We remember today Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, and we wonder how long, oh Lord. So much of what we are seeing in our world is brokenness, be it from natural disasters or the power and pervasive presence of cruelty and domination, we are standing in what seems to be a forgotten and forsaken land. I'm sure you've seen it, or perhaps you're standing the land of grief and lost hope. And the priest Ezekiel was called to be a prophet to the people of Israel during a time of deep despair and hopelessness. He had seen God's promised people lose their place in the world. He had seen his people be carried away to Babylon while their holy city remained in ruins. He had seen his people in exile in a foreign land where they were bereft of all they knew and they were tormented by their captors. Had God not promised the protection of Zion? Had God not made a covenant with God's people that only a descendant of David would rule their capital city? Hear with me their resignation. Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. This is what they'd seen. The ordered life of Israel and its covenantal community had been transposed into a displaced, deported, defeated remnant with no hope and deep loss. And yet it's amidst this grave reality of Israel's disintegrating independence and identity that Ezekiel is swept up and once again transported in our text. This time, he's taken to a high mountain where he watches 
as the waters flow under the threshold of a new temple and out the gates. He sees the waters measure ankle deep and then knee deep and then waist deep and then too deep to cross. While thinking of his deserted and hopeless people, our scripture continues and he is told. This water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah. And when it enters the sea, the sea of stagnant waters, all will become fresh. Wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live, and there will be many fish once these waters reach there. It will become fresh, and everything will live where the river goes. On the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. There will be fruit for food, and their leaves will be for healing. Mortal, he's asked, have you seen this? Ezekiel begins to understand. The vision demonstrates the effects of God's presence. It depicts the overflow of God's provision. Everything will live where the river goes. Ezekiel sees that Israel does in fact have a future. Ezekiel sees that Israel has not been forgotten. Ezekiel sees that in God there is sustaining and transforming life-giving hope. What had been violated was to be restored Mortal, he's asked, have you seen this? We have all experienced profound losses of hope. Be it from the death of loved ones, the loss of a dream, the failed relationships, or perhaps the experience of oppression and hatred. Our theological certainties about who God is have at some point collided with the shock of despair and displacement and grief. And yet Ezekiel's vision of hope is ours to see too. And so we cannot, we must not, let our resources, our circumstances, our shattered and broken world dictate our vision. Mortal, have you seen? Have you seen what God can do? Have you seen the life-giving waters rise from ankle deep to knee deep to waist deep to too deep to cross? Have you seen hope, love, and peace rise? I can hear the voice of my nephew echo, what do you see? And if we cannot see, if we do not have a vision of the loving, liberating, and life-giving power of God, then how can we proclaim hope to our people? You know, Ezekiel was called during one of the most critical periods in Israel's history, but I tell you, we also are called during another critical period in history. We too must convince our neighbors that despite all the brokenness we see, that this is not all that there is to be seen. We too must convince our neighbors of the unparalleled power of God, and we must work to discern our future as the people of God. We cannot afford to be small in our vision because our visions of hope are distinctive marks of our faith that possess dangerous and revolutionary social potential. Martin Luther King Jr. is recognized for summoning a once paralyzed community to move beyond the imperial definitions of their day. I have a dream was just such a summons. His visioning of a different future changed reality. It began to crack open and a homecoming to a more just dispensation became possible. We have a pastoral responsibility to invite a reimagination of reality. We must abandon the dominant script that says that all hope is gone and embrace another script in which God is our liberator in which hope rises, kindness rises, love rises, and peace rises. Walter Brueggemann puts it like this. Human transformation does not come through didacticism. 
but through the playful entertainment of another scripting in which the old given text leads to a new reality. God has a dream for our world, and we must be willing to live and speak in the space that exists between what is and what can be, between what we see and what is to be seen. Hear the words of the Psalter. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. Mortal, have you seen? Amen. Amen.